want to start off today's message asking you a question, and uh, I, you don't even have to raise your hand because I know the answer for the majority of you is, is yes. How many people start their day with their cell phone? So the first thing that you do, maybe before you get out of bed, is you pick up your phone. So I'll, 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 I'll do like an icebreaker. I'll let you guys in a little bit on my life. I, I do this. I, I, I start my day with my phone, and no, I'm not opening the Bible app and, and reading Bible verses. I'm not checking inspiration. I'm doing this thing that if, if there's anyone else in the room that does this, I, you're going to be my best friend, and I just don't know you yet. But I do this thing where I go to the, I have an iPhone, where I go to the app store, and, and I look to see if any of my applications have updates, and, because I like to read the notes, I like to see what bugs are being fixed or what new features they're launching. And so when I wake up, I go to the, I go to the app store and I, I hit refresh and I update all. Then I get up and I have my coffee and I have a quiet time and I read the Bible. But isn't that dorky? I mean, that's like the most nerdy thing in the world. Um, my, my, my wife knows this very, very well uh, about me. So if anyone else in the room does that, please meet me after the service. We're long lost brothers and we just don't. <laughs> We just don't know it yet. But typically, if you're not like me, what happens in the morning, if you start your day with your phone, is you start your day on doing, doing what I call like the social media shuffle. So you're on Instagram, you're on Facebook, you're on Twitter. Uh, for the seven older people in the room, you're on LinkedIn. You know, you're looking at, at different things. <laughs> I'm glad I got somebody with that. That was good. You're, but but you're, you're doing this social media shuffle. You want to know what was posted. You want to check what, what message, how many likes did you get on a picture or how many retweets did you get. You, I mean, you know the game. You know the hustle. And, and then for those of you that are even more bold and more daring, you know, you dip into your messages or you dip into WhatsApp or maybe you even dip into your email. I cannot imagine starting the day with, with uh, opening up WhatsApp or even opening up my email. I know some of you wish that I would start my day that way so that I would reply sooner. But I just, those of you that can do that, you're special. And I, as I was trying to think about this, sort of this philosophically, how do, I, how, do I, how do I bring you guys along on the journey that I want to bring you along on? I thought of an example. Okay, so imagine that you wake up in the morning, and you're laying in bed, and on the nightstand or the table next to you, there's a glass of water. Now, this glass of water is yours. Every morning, you get a fresh glass of water. It's filtered. It's clean. It's perfect drinking temperature. It's, it's everything that you would want. It's not frosted. It's not leaving, you know, rings and stains on the table underneath it. It's just perfectly placed there for you. Now, what happens as you go throughout the day, let's say you're laying in bed and you open Instagram. What you do is you, you pop a little drop of Instagram in that water. You open Facebook, you pop a little drop in there. You open your email, you pop a little drop in there. And so all morning and all day, the things that you're consuming or the things that you're doing or the things that you're looking at or the things that you're interacting with, you're, you're popping little droplets of that. I mean, some of you essential oil people know this, you know, just a, a tiny little dab, a little droplet. And then at the end of the day, what you have to do is you have to drink that water. So my question is, is would you like the way that it tastes? Would, you, would it be something enjoyable? See, the, the thing that I was thinking about is like, you know what, maybe some people have their lives set up in a way where they would love the way that it tastes. Maybe it, it tastes like your favorite fizzy drink or something. But for the majority of us, maybe we would not love the way that that tasted at the end of the day. Then the next morning, it starts all over again. You're given a clean glass of water. And as you go throughout the day, the experiences that you have, little droplets of those go in that water. Now, if it were me, my goal would be to try and, and keep the water tasting like, like water. So that at the end of the day, I was finishing my day with this clean, kind of refreshing glass of water. So the problem that happens to us, the reason that, that I'm bringing this analogy to you, and I want you to think about it in this way, is that we have a hard time switching off. We have a hard time saying, okay, we're, we're not going to going to allow this input or this input into our lives. We're, we're not going to wake up in the morning and the first thing that we're going to do is put a little droplet of Instagram or a droplet of email or a droplet of, 
of whatever in there. Instead, we're going to learn how to try and like switch off our brain. But our brain needs to be, it needs switched off. Our brain needs to be reset. See, we, we need opportunities where, where we can actually kind of like come down a little bit. So we, we weren't made to run full steam 24-7. We were made to have a break. We were made to switch off. But a lot of us don't switch off. We just keep adding and adding and adding little bits and pieces to that glass of water that at the end of the day, we're going to have to drink. And for many of us, that is, is toxic. And the reason that, that we can't switch off, the reason that we feel like we cannot switch off, because so many of us, if I were to ask you, if I were to say, hey, how much downtime do you have? You'd say, well, you know, I don't really have a lot of downtime. Or if I were to ask you and say, so... You know, I, I, I love doing this. You, know, you ask people to help you move, and they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm busy. You know, my diary is, is completely filled up. But, but we, we walk around and we say, I, I can't switch off because switched on 24-7, I can barely keep up. So if you're wanting me to switch my brain off, if you're wanting me to stop putting things in that glass of water, I, I just don't see how that's possible. But the problem that that creates, the problem that we have And that we don't recognize is that there is a major problem with how busy we are. Our problem is that we're just too busy. See, we we are consumed with what we have to do. And in fact, let's so let's look at it another way. Let's say you work from eight to five. And then when you get off work, you, you do things like go to the gym, or you do things like, like you're on YouTube, or you're on Instagram, or you're watching things on Netflix, or whatever it is, but you're cons- you never stop consuming. You never stop and take a second to, to slow down or to switch off. And really what's happening is you're basically working two jobs. So it's like from the time you wake up in the morning to the time that you go to bed at night, you're doing something. You're switched on. And what's happening is we're busy not only because we work, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week, but also because in our downtime, we're still switched on. We're still on. We're still doing something. And now what's happening here, because we're talking about peace. Today is our second message on peace. Last week, uh, you know, we kind of broke down how you can get peace and how it's adding God in rather than taking things away. And, and that's true. No matter how many things you take away, it doesn't guarantee peace. But what guarantees peace is adding, the, adding God or adding the Holy Spirit into your life. But when you're too busy, when you're, when you're just so busy, see, something happens and it's this. Our, our pace of life actually starts to undermine our peace. So your pace undermines your peace. And what that means is that, is that the, the pace that you're going, how fast you're going throughout the day, the, the amount that you're taking on, the busyness that you carry, it, it just continues to undermine your peace because you can never, you can never really like tap into it. See, we, we all want peace in our life. We all want more peace. But we all deal with this conundrum of life just being too busy. And we deal with this, this issue of, of, I wish that I could do less, or I wish that I had less to do. We, we wish that our pace was slower, because if my life was just a little bit slower, then I would have a little bit more peace in my life. You know, if you get to a place where I find myself often, where uh, you, you can't clean your house, you can't clean the bathrooms, or you can't you know, take care of the yard or the garden or the dishes start piling up or, or the, the kids, you know, like you forgot to bathe them for a couple days or, or whatever it is. But, but I, I just before I move on in this message, I want you to take a look at your life and I want you to examine, do I have a list of things building that I just can't get to? Are there a list of relationships that I should be tending to that I just can't get to? Is there a relationship, is there something between, is there something in your relationship with yourself that you just haven't been able to get to? Is there something that you're trying to deal with within you? Because, see, relationships are important. We believe that, that you have a relationship between you and God, and then we believe that you have a relationship between you and yourself. You know, it's how you see yourself, how you view yourself, how you think about yourself. And so many of us have horrible relationships with ourselves. 
And it's horrible because it takes time. We have to take time to work on ourselves. And many of us, we end up there where, you know, where if we can't get our relationship with, our right, with ourselves right, then, then something's wrong with our pace. Something's wrong with how much we're doing and how much we're, we're trying to accomplish in the day. So I, I just want to highlight that to you because this is so important. It's so important because I know what happens in your home because it happens in my home. You know, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock, whenever it is for you guys. It's like when the day comes to this crescendo and you realize that like the day is done. You're exhausted. The kids are cranky. You've got to start bath time and bedtime. And then by the time everyone's down and in bed and everyone's had some food to eat, you know, it's 9 o'clock or 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, you know, depending on how your family works. And you're just done. You're exhausted. The day is over. The day is done. And, and some of you go on and you continue working. But I want you to think about your pace. The pace at which you're living life. Now the only way that we can deal with this. The only way that we can, that we can really manage our pace. Is if we insert something. L- last week we talked about inserting God into your life brought you peace. It's not about taking things away. So I don't want you to think about this as, okay, I need to take away my job or I need to take away my relationship with my spouse in order to have peace. Now, that, that's not what I'm talking about here. Again, we're inserting things in order to get access to peace. So if you find yourself outpacing peace, if you find yourself too busy to deal with your to-do list or, or all the, the personal things in your life that you're trying to deal with, then what you're going to insert is, is one word, and it's called rest. You're going to insert rest into your life. Now, I, I hate this word. I'm not a huge fan of, of this word. Now, I'm not necessarily a workaholic. Don't look at my wife when I say that. But I, I, I don't like the idea of just shutting down and having to just rest. You know, ha- having to say, okay, I'm going to let go. Another way that I look at rest is, is letting go. So I'll give you an example. This morning, I tried something, uh, you know, here in the church. Normally, I get here, you know, 5.50, 6 o'clock in the morning, and I start switching things on, and I start, you know, uh, cleaning the parking lot and nailing the flags in the ground. And, and I'm, I'm no warrior or hero for doing all of that stuff. I just, honestly, I want to honor our, our volunteers and I want to think, okay, what can I get going for them? But also, there is this aspect of, I want to make sure that it's right. And the reason that I want to make sure that it's right is because I value you guys, and I care about you guys, and I want to make sure that your experience is, is a good experience. The, the, the flag in the ground needs to be straight up and down, and things need to be in, in like the right order. But today, I inserted rest into my morning. And so I still came at 6 o'clock this morning. But what I did today is I grabbed a cup of coffee and I walked around and I rested. And I talked to people and I hung out. But that's the kind of rest that I struggle the most with. And that's probably along the lines of the kind of rest that you struggle with. For some of you, it may be sleep. You may need more sleep. For some of you, it may be letting go of things. For some of you, it may be the, the idea of just having more rhythm to your life, where you have some ups and you have some downs, but there, there's got to be rest. And I think it's helpful to think about this from the viewpoint of adding rest rather than taking things away. I didn't have to take away my right or my ability to come at 6 o'clock this morning, but I came with a restful heart, with a restful spirit, and it was a great morning, and you guys had a great morning getting here. And so for the rest of this message, I'm going to be talking to you about rest. And I'm going to give you some things. So I'm I'm going to give you some examples as to why rest should be part of your rhythms. Why why should rest be a part of your your rhythms? Because I want to now introduce the second word to you, the word rhythm. So if you think about, we, we had... Joshua on drums this morning, and Joshua is somebody that, that as a church, we just love him dearly. He is just incredible. We've been really blessed to have him join our team and to have his whole family here. But if Joshua sat down on the drums, and he just, just banged and banged and banged and made noise, then it would just sound like noise. 
right? It would just be noise. It would just be just beats, just be noise. But what happens is, in order for that noise to then sound like rhythm, or in order for that noise to sound like something, or in order for that noise to be trackable or followable or something that gets our foot tapping, what there has to be is there, have to be, there has to be rest in there. See, rest mixed in with, kind of with, with the noise is what creates that rhythm. And then you get the rhythm of the drums, and that makes everything better. But see, without rest... There's no way for us to have rhythms because it would just be one solid input of noise or one solid input of life. And that's something that that it's not doing well for us. It's not doing well for you. I know that. Because you come in here this morning and you're exhausted and you're tired and you're wondering why Monday feels so stressful and you're wondering why the week is going to be so stressful. You know, I can't take I can't make your week go better. But what I can do is try and get you to understand the concept of if I can just rest, then I can reestablish some really healthy, important rhythms in my life. And so we're going to look at three reasons. I like to give you three when I can because it's easy to remember as to why rest is something that should be part of your rhythm. So the first one that we're going to look at is that God designed rest. God designed rest. So no one in here is God, as far as I know and I can tell. And so if God designed rest, if God needed rest, then we need rest. And so we're going to look at a verse here. And and this is so, this to me is so interesting. I I can't wait to read you the verse because then I'm going to explain something to you. And it, yeah, it just blew my mind when I thought about this. But so this is Genesis 2 and verses 2 through 3. And what's happened before this? is God has just created everything. He's created, you know, the earth and the heavens, and, and God's been working, working, working. He's created so much. He's, you know, he's, he's been busy. God's been busy. He's been doing stuff, not piddling around, but just purposefully creating everything that would become us and everything that we have. And so then, by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested. Then God blessed the seventh day, so it's like, hey, the day, the, re- the day that you rested is actually a blessed day, which means rest will be a blessing to you, which means that if you're missing a blessing in your life, maybe a blessing of peace, then maybe you need to add some rest into your day because I guarantee you that God is going to bless that rest for you. And so then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So when I read this verse, I think about, you know, God just being like, whoo, man, that was exhausting. That, I, you know, created all that. I need a rest. I need a break. But I'll tell you this. God did not rest because he was tired. Let I me mean, think about that. God did, did not rest because he was tired. Instead, God rested because he wanted to establish for us the rhythms and the cadence by which we need to live by. See, God God has, this this is so important. God took time out of creation to establish to you, to show you. He built it into creation. He did not have to rest, but he built it into creation that there was a cadence that we need to live by, meaning You can work, 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 work. That's great. But you got to rest. And then on top of that, God says, I'm going to bless the rest. I'm going to bless the day that you rest. I'm going to bless you on the day that you rest. And I'm going to make it holy, which means it's sanctified. It's special. It's something that, that, that God holds endeared to his heart. And so here you have the creator of the universe laying out for us at the beginning of your Bible. In Genesis, at the very beginning... He's laying out that you should rest because God purposefully designed rest. Now, if you struggle with finding peace in your life, I'm going to say this over and over and over again. If you struggle with finding peace in your life, that's because you're not living in a way that God created you to live. And God created us to need rest. He put, 
it, it still boggles my mind. As much intentionality as God put into creating man and woman and the earth and the stars. See, that's the stuff that we like reading in Genesis. Wow, you know, God created the earth and the stars and whether dinosaurs or not and all, the, all these big questions that we have. And still, we miss this. But God is saying, no, no, no. Another thing that I created and that I blessed and that I made holy was the rest. So I, I just want you to see that God, your creator, designed you to need this. Now, the second thing that we're going to look at is Jesus. So we talked about God. Now we're going to talk about Jesus. So God designed rest. Jesus demonstrated rest. Now, I'm going to just warn you, my third point does not have a, a D word highlighted in it. And I'm, I'm, I, I wish that I could have done that. But God designed rest. Jesus demonstrated rest. And Jesus, he does this thing that's so cool in Scripture, and we're going to unpack it a little bit. But God designed it, and so then when Jesus comes, he comes, and he says, okay, I'm going to show you how to do it. And so Jesus demonstrates it. And we're actually going to turn to, to Mark, and here in Mark 1, 29 through 30, I'm, I'm going to read out of my Bible while you guys look at it on the screen here. And then it, it says this, okay, that, so here, here's the story. Let me kind of set this up for you. Jesus is walking around, and he, he's healing people. Jesus is working. Jesus is busy. And so what happens is, is Jesus has been in the synagogue, and he's been, he's been teaching. He's been doing things. He actually you know, had been healing someone. And so Jesus, who's, who's been busy, he comes from the synagogue where he's been doing stuff. And that leads us into this verse here in verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue... They, meaning Jesus and the disciples, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. So in verse 30, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. You know what's interesting about, about this verse here is that they say that, that she had this thing called like, like burning fever. And, and there was actually, th this was a, a sickness or an illness that, that they had kind of a magical cure for. And what they did when, when someone had this fever is, is they would put a, a knife made only of iron. And they would tie it to sort of like sticks and branches. And then for three days, they would repeat verses in Exodus. So Exodus, I think, two, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, 4, and 5 and they would repeat those, and it talks about Moses and the burning bush and, and a couple other things. But the point is, is that there's a three-day process that ends with a magical potion, which is supposed to heal someone that has this fever. And what Jesus, what Jesus walks in and does here, and this is just bonus content for you, is Jesus walks in and he does what they thought they needed magic to do in three days, and he does it just in, in one. He just does it in, in one sitting. And what he's demonstrating here is his authority. He's demonstrating, I have, I'm Jesus, and I have authority over earth. I have authority over sickness. I have authority over even everything that you see and everything that you do. I've got authority over it. And so that's what Jesus does when he just says, when he heals her, he just says, hey, get up. And the, the other thing that I just want to hit on before I move on that Jesus is demonstrating to us is that Jesus had just been healing people in public. And now Jesus is in the privacy of a home, and he very quietly just heals this woman. And so that, that just shows, like, Jesus not only was in it for, he wasn't in it for the fame and for the gain. Jesus was in it for the person. And so he walked in authority, he stood in authority, and he acted in authority. So here you have a God in flesh, Jesus Christ, who can do anything that he wants to do. Meaning, he can cast out demons, he can heal people, he can do anything that he wants to do. And he's shown it in this verse. He's healed people in public, he's healed someone in private. And now, in verse 32, it goes on to, it goes on to say this. Very, uh, 32, that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. So what's happened, for you guys to know, is that the Sabbath is over. So the Sabbath ends on a Saturday night at 6 p.m. So that's what it means here when it says, 
That evening after sunset, the people were sitting around waiting on the Sabbath to end. As soon as the Sabbath ended, the law told them that they could now move around and do things. And they immediately went to Jesus. Immediately, as soon as the Sabbath was over, they immediately went there and started doing things, br- bringing people to Jesus. And so, Jesus in, in verse 34, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus, now in verse 35, Jesus prays very early in the morning while it was still dark. Jesus got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So what I want you to get from this is that if the creator of the universe in flesh who has authority to heal people, who has authority to set people's lives free, if he feels the need to get up early in the morning and go spend time set apart and set aside and spend time working and and spending time with God, then how much more do we need it in our life? So again, this is Jesus demonstrating the fact that we need rest. Because he did that in his own life. And the last point that I want you to know is this, is that the reason that you need rest is because you need it. You were designed to need rest. You, you were created to need this. That This is something that you can't avoid or you can't get away from it. See, Jesus, he was working hard. And as he was working hard, he realized, hey, I'm working hard on this, but I, I still need rest rest. And he he took the time out to rest. And so when I think about you guys, as I just think about this church, and I think about the the lives of of everyone in here, busyness is something that, that gets all of us. It's something that we all struggle with. And peace is something that we all want more of. Peace is something that that we that that we long for. And in fact, while you're sitting here, before things get busy out there, I just want you to think to yourself, how much peace do I have in my life right now? How, how much peace practically do I feel in my life right now? Am I excited for Monday? Am I excited for the week to come? Have I, have I been resting? Have I let go of what I need to let go of? Have I given up on, on what I need to give up on? Have, have, I, have I just sat quietly for just a few minutes? How long has it been since I've done that? How long has it been since I felt like I had margin to do that? See, I just have this sense right now, just this, this extreme kind of feeling in my heart that there's a bunch of people sitting out there that are really struggling right now saying, I just can't get it all done. I just can't do it. I just need more time or I need more capacity, or I need less things to do. And one of the themes that we're tracking in the series about peace, which we all want, is that peace is not contingent on things you can take away, because you'll always be taking things away. You cancel one day of meetings, you know what? There's going to be another week that you're going to be busy with meetings. You cancel... Um, you know, what, one work appointment, there's going to be another work appointment. You take something out of your life, like you say, okay, I'm no longer going to, going to do this in the morning for this amount of time. Whatever it is in your life, whatever it is that you're dealing with, or that, that you have, it, no matter how much you remove, you're still going to be looking for peace because something else is just going to fill that gap. Something else is just going to take its place. And so what we have in these two scriptures that we looked at today is we've got this reality that, hey, it, this is for you to accept. This, this is for you to accept. And, and I'm going to say this, and then I'm just going to give you guys a moment to do this and to enjoy this and to think about it. But for you to accept is this. I cannot and you cannot do anything to give yourself more peace. The burden that you carry and the load that you carry on your shoulders. I cannot do anything to make that lighter. And you cannot do anything to make that lighter. Think about it. What are you carrying? What's here? What's on your shoulders? 
What burden do you have? There's, there's, there's nothing that you can do to make that lighter. Because when you do, something else just jumps back on. When you get rid of one thing, another thing gets put back on. But what happens is, is, is as we've seen in the way God created it, in the way Jesus designed it, and the fact that you need it in those three things, is there's this thing that happens where we get the opportunity to just be and to just let God work in our lives. And so for those of you that may, maybe you know Jesus, you have a relationship with him, you know, this is you sitting down with your Bible or having a quiet time or sitting down for a prayer time. Or maybe for some of you it's meditation or some of you it's just mindfulness. Wh- whatever it is, for some of you, it, it, it could just be sitting silently with a cup of coffee for a few minutes. But I just want to challenge you to do something to quiet yourself and to add in this thing called rest where, where you're actually taking a rest where you cut out the input and you take the rest. Now, there's one thing that I, that I worry about for you guys. I, I really I worry about it, and I kind of stress about it. And it's this. If you don't slow your life down, then life is going to slow you down for you. And that may come through an injury. It may come through, uh, through work. It may come through, through some, you know, a broken relationship. But if you don't take the time to slow down, life is going to slow you down. You know, if you think about this in terms of exercise, I'll never forget March 17th, two years ago, I did a bunch of, of deadlifts in the morning and then went to do uh, some, some sprints and running and I tore my hamstring and it was like, I thought I was invincible. I could just go, 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 go. And I still, two years later, have got hamstring problems. And so, for those of you out there, it, it's not, you, you have to rest. And I don't want to see you hit the wall of life or see life hit you like a wall and then it make you rest. Because there's one thing that happens. There's one thing that happens when you get too tired. And it's you lose your resolve. And what that means is, is, is this. It means that you lose the ability to stand for what's good in your marriage. You lose the ability to stand for what's good in you. You lose the ability to stand for what's right. Do you ever wonder why when you're tired, you're more cranky? You ever wonder why when you're overwhelmed, you're just more irritable? Well, it's because you're lacking rest and you have a hard time then, then having the resolve to say, you know what, I'm not going to be agitated with this person or that person. I'm, I'm just going to let it go. Yeah, I don't want life to hit you, and I don't want you to hit others in life because you've just lost your resolve. And so I'm going to finish this sermon out today with this. I want you guys to think about how in your life you can rest. I want you to think about where in your life you can add rest into your life. And so I'm going to give you a moment this morning to do that. I'm going to give you an opportunity when the band comes out to play a song. I'm going to pray, and then they're going to come out. And when you guys stand to sing, I want you to think about, is there a place in my life where I could actually rest, where I could add rest into my life? Now, before you go out there and before things get crazy and before things get busy, I just want you to think, even if you stand here or sit here quietly, what would it be like if you just took one minute this morning and you just introduced rest into your morning.